fantastic. Right, um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, absolutely spectacular and diverse event. Um, I, hope, I hope I'll be able to contribute to the diversity of this meeting. So my talk here is um, on the subject, which is in a sense the exact opposite of what the previous speaker uh, was talking about. I'm going to discuss adiabatic protocols as, as opposed to the quench protocols, very slow protocols in driven many body systems. And I'll present a, a rather general results relating to those, those systems. It can be applied to strongly correlated systems. It can be applied to weakly correlated systems. Um, initially, our research on this subject was motivated by a strongly correlated example, but I'm not going to consider it today because it is very special, and probably not very exciting for many people. I will focus on something uh, a lot more simple to, to demonstrate how this technique works in the many body system. So what I'm going to, to do today is I briefly discuss uh, motivation, what adiabatic protocols are, their relationship to the adiab adiabatic theorem, um, and what extensions it has. Um, I'll state the main question or the main deficiency of the adiabatic th theorem and how people uh, are working to, to mend this today. And uh, then I'll state our main results. I'll try to keep it simple. I'll try to, to write as few equations as I can. And these are going to be, uh, again, as opposed to the previous speaker, these are going to be short equations. So hopefully um, I'll, I'll be able to, to explain uh, in a very simple terms our results. And then I'll discuss an example. I have to apologize to the, to the organizers. There's not going to be a strongly correlated example. This is going to be a weakly correlated system or, in fact, in, uh, an uncorrelated system. However, if you are interested in, in uh, interacting many body systems, applications to those systems of our results, you can look on the archive for uh, two recent papers published by, by this authors. Okay, so adiabatic protocols. The idea of um, an adiabatic protocol is, is shown in this picture. So let me explain what is shown here. Suppose I have a Hamiltonian which uh, depends on a number of parameters. And this yellow thing here is the parameter space for this Hamiltonian. And let's imagine that uh, at, at uh, some point the Hamiltonian was placed at this point of the parameter space. To each point of the parameter space, you can associate um, a point in the projective Hilbert space of the system, which is the ground state of this Hamiltonian. This denote, denoted phi in, in this picture. So phi is the ground state of the Hamiltonian uh, taken at a particular point of the parameter space. Now let's imagine that we prepared our system in the ground state initially, and then we slowly change the parameters of our Hamiltonian, so it describes some trajectory in this parameter space, then the initial state will evolve along a certain curve under Schrodinger's evolution. So that's, that's the trajectory shown here. And the physical state which results from this evolution is called Psi. Uh, there is another trajectory which I can draw on the same projective Hilbert space, which is the uh, trajectory described by the ground states of instantaneous ground states of the Hamiltonian, which are denoted phi here. And these two trajectories generally do not have to be the same, of course. However, an important result was proven in 1928, which says that if, if the driving is sufficiently slow, I can keep these two trajectories as close to each other as possible. And so this is the statement by Born and Fork. 
this theorem can be extended to, to degenerate run states. I'm not going to, to uh, dig into that. Uh, for us, this formulation, this statement will be sufficient. Okay. Um, um, this theorem has uh, plenty of uh, applications in physics, and what I'm going to talk, uh, what I'm going to mention here, are practical applications, are pl applications uh, which are almost engineering. And one one example is uh, the Tallis pump, more generally adiabatic transport in mesoscopic systems. Um, this is a very schematic representation of this device. Uh, we have two reservoirs which are connected by a region of a gapped material. So there are lots of particles inside this region and it has a gap inside. And this is the region uh, whose parameters I can control experimentally. So this is the parameter space and let's imagine that I perform uh, some cycle, some closed curve in the parameter space as a function of time. Uh, also, keeping inside this uh, cycle a region where this segment of my system is gapless. So I perform a cycle around this singularity in the parameter space. Then, uh, as was pointed out by Talis, if the driving is adiabatic, so if adiabatistic conditions are fulfilled, that is the system is not excited from its current state as it moves around, exactly one particle will be transferred from, from left reservoir to the right reservoir. So the current to the system will be quantized. So that's, that's a fantastic example. And uh, later on, I sh I'll show you uh, experimental, recent experimental realizations of this protocol. It was realized actually only uh, two years ago. Uh, another example of uh, uh, application, possible application of um, adiabaticity or adiabatic protocols is non-abelian braiding for the purposes of quantum computation. And these are, these are the ideas which were originally emerged uh, in, in late 80s, early 90, 90s, the late 80s, early 90s, but uh, they became popular uh, in the beginning of this century because, well, due to the Kitaev's, due to Kitaev's works. So the, the idea is certain strongly correlated systems, or actually there are weakly correlated examples as well, um, can have degenerate ground states, topologically protected degenerate ground states. If I pun punch holes in the, in, in the space where this uh, quantum systems reside. And one example is, is of course, uh, the archetypal example is the new equal uh, five half quantum pole system. And the, the holes are uh, vortex like excitations in the system. Now, if I move adiabatically slowly, move these vortices uh, around each other, if I braid them, then uh, that is equivalent to performing a, a unitary operation on the uh, degenerate ground state manifold. And this operation does not care about the exact way I, I, uh, I move the particles around. The only thing it cares is the, uh, uh, what, the, what element of the braid group is represented by this braid, not, not on the details of the trajectories. Okay, so this is, this is another example and, and it uh, is being explored very intensively in different, in different communities. People are, are trying to, to implement this in uh, topological superconductors, Kitaev, uh, uh, looking for Kitaev chain, or uh, Kitaev lattices, fermions with P-wave uh, pairing. Right, and uh, just another example that I, I'd like to mention, it is, it is important, it is an example of adiabatic quantum computations. There is an excellent review which, which appeared uh, earlier this year, which covers this subject extensively, so I, I recommend you to have a look uh, at this, uh, this review if you are interested in this subject. Uh, the idea of uh, the adiabatic quantum computation is that you prepare uh, a Hamiltonian fuel system 
in, in uh, a way that you understand and control its ground state. And then you deform, gradually deform your Hamiltonian into uh, a, a messy one for which you do not know the ground state. And uh, adiabaticity ensures you that the uh, state that you obtain as a result of this evolution is the ground state of this messy Hamiltonian. And this is the ground state you're interested in. Um, and there, there are um, multiple applications of this idea in uh, quantum computation. Right, so let me uh, briefly summarize what we've seen. In all, all these examples, the protocols are performed on large many body systems. Some of them can be strongly correlated, some do not have to be. The correct operation of the protocol requires a diabeticity, so the, the ground state does not, well, so the actual state of the system does not deviate from the instantaneous ground state. Uh, the diabeticity theorem uh, tells us that indeed it, it is possible to achieve a diabeticity in the system, but it has nothing to say about the conditions for the diabeticity, how slowly I need to drive the system to achieve uh, a diabeticity, adiabatic conditions. And uh, from the experimental point of view, from, from the practical point of view, this is an extremely, of course, an extremely important question. We need to know uh, if our system is adiabatic or not. So the question is how slowly do we need to drive a quantum system to achieve um, adiabatic conditions? Uh, before uh, uh, discussing uh, uh, the answer to this question, I'll, I'll introduce a uh, sl slightly more formal notation. So we have this uh, parameter space and there is a trajectory in this parameter space which I parameterize by a single parameter lambda and h as a function of x of lambda will be called h sub lambda. Uh, now, without a loss of generality, because that depends on my parameterization, without a loss of generality, I can say that lambda as a function of t is a linear function of t uh, multiplied by gamma, and gamma is called the driving rate or the ramp rate in the system. Now, the uh, instantaneous ground states are parameterized by lambda and are given by this equation. And Schrodinger's equation can be recast in this form as, as an equation um, for the wave function as a function of lambda and gamma appears as a parameter on the left-hand side of the equation. So this, this is pretty straightforward. The initial condition for the equation is that the initial physical state coincides with the instantaneous ground state and what we are looking for we're looking at is the adiabatic fidelity. The adiabatic fidelity is essentially the overlap between the uh, instantaneous ground state and the physical state squared. Uh, if adiabatic fidelity is close to one, we are happy. If it is very, very small, we are unhappy. So that's, that's the idea, which can, of course, be reformulated in rigorous mathematical terms. Uh, now, the adiabatic theorem now, it has a very, very short statement. Um, the adiabatic fidelity uh, goes to one if the driving rate goes to zero. And this convergence is, of course, uh, non-uniform and stuff, but I'm not going to, to discuss this in detail. That's, that's the rigorous statement of, of this theorem. Um, now, I'll discuss, well, I'll give you a very brief overview of, of known results. Uh, the archetypal model, uh, which is an exactly solvable model uh, where you can de derive the adipotistic condition is, is the landau zener model, again, 1932, very early uh, in the days of quantum mechanics. Um, the Hamiltonian there is, is a two-level Two level Hamiltonian. This one, there is a parameter delta, a gap parameter in the system, there is a, uh, a uh, Pauli matrix sigma z here. So this is the uh, initial Hamiltonian, and this is the perturbation which contains the Pauli matrix, matrix sigma x. These are the levels of, of this model as a function of time, and we want 
the system to follow the instantaneous ground state which corresponds to this uh, level here. So the exact solution of this model shows that the adiabatic fidelity is given by this expression here. It is one minus e to the power minus pi delta over gamma. Uh, so if the driving is very, very slow, this exponential function goes to zero. If it is uh, large, the fidelity is zero, which is not what we want to achieve. So uh, the conclusion is the fidelity is close to one as long as gamma is much less than delta. Um, this exact, exactly solvable model is very nice. However, it does not easily or admit uh, generalizations to, to uh, systems with large Hilbert spaces, let alone many body systems. Many body systems have huge Hilbert spaces. So there are lots and lots and dense set of levels above on the ground state. Actually, the speaker after me is going to uh, discuss uh, many level generalizations of, of this problem, which are exactly soluble. And this is an interesting direction uh, of, of, of research. However, generally, if you are dealing with the many body system, uh, you have exactly zero chance of solving the time evolution of a time-dependent Hamiltonian. It is a very, very complex problem, a lot more complex than finding the ground state of the system, for example. Okay, so what do we have instead? So the only hope, then, is you can try and uh, find some reasonable bounds on the speed of uh, an adiabatic process, and the, uh, the, the, there has been uh, a generalization of of the landau zener bound, uh, which, which is still used uh, by people in, in different communities, which is to say that uh, if I take a, um, an overlap between the, the time-dependent, uh, the lambda-dependent ground state and the derivative of, of an excited state, if I take the maximum of this expression, it has to be less than the excitation gap. If this is true, this, by the way, is, is the criterion, uh, exactly the criterion that you have in the landau a problem, but um, it is not, it does not work generally. And there, there has been some discussion of this in, in different literature. This is actually a very, very bad criterion for uh, large systems. Um, and the, yeah, this is just an example that this, uh, this way of thinking about uh, conditions for the adiabaticity is still encountered in literature. Now, um, there have been efforts to, to overcome uh, these difficulties using rigorous mathematics, using the operator theory. And there is a whole school of thought which uh, was initiated by Carter in 1950, which tries to, to generalize Land the landau zener criterion to uh, arbitrary Hamiltonians in arbitrary Hilbert spaces using uh, norm estimates and the known spectral, spectral properties of the, of the Hamiltonian. So that, that, this is a typical result from this community. This is not Carter's result. This is, uh, 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 the result from uh, subsequent work, but, uh, but I'm showing it to you here, just uh, just so you just to demonstrate that the the main idea in this in in, in these calculations is you you take a second or a third derivative of your Hamiltonian with respect to the parameter, you calculate the spectral norm. Of, of this operator divided by the gap to some power, and then you re demand that uh, your uh, evolution time is, is uh, greater than this expression. So these are rigorous, sufficient conditions for adiabaticity, and it turns out they are not extremely good uh, in many body systems. And the main reason, of course, is that on the right-hand side of this expression, I have a norm of an operator, and the norm of an operator in a huge 
Hilbert space, well, in, in an actual Hilbert space, it tends to be unbounded. So the expression on the right-hand side is just meaningless unless you impose some cutoffs on the, on the Hilbert space of your system, and then your answers depend on these cutoffs. <coughs> and the whole thing gets very, very complicated. So even if you do that, um, you, you end up with an expression which is, which is very, very large on the right-hand side because of, of uh, nature of, the, of, of having a, a big Hilbert space. And that, uh, that makes your sufficient conditions very stringent. This approach also doesn't give you a necessary condition for, for other Batistas. Okay, so now we are gradually moving to, to our main observation. Um, the, there are some interesting insights into adiabatistic conditions from the many body physics sites or from the um, uh, strongly related site. So there, there were two publications in 2008 where two groups analyzed in different contexts adiabaticity conditions in many body systems. And uh, the, actually, the conclusions were, were similar. And I, I just uh, boxed uh, the, uh, the abstract of, of this publication here. And, and this is important. So they essentially, they say that the structure of the theory suggests that the, uh, uh, sorry, the, we formulate and approximately solve a specific many-body generalization of the landau zener problem. Unlike the single particle landau zener problem, our system does not abide in a diabetic ground state, even at very slow driving rates. Our solution can be used to understand an example, behavior of two-level systems coupled to electromagnetic fields and blah, blah, blah. But the, uh, the main observation is that the if the system is large, if the system is a many-body system, then for some reason, um, the driving has to be extremely slow to, uh, to ensure a diabetist in the system, and they speculate in their paper that this, this could be some general effect pertaining to all many-body systems. So many-body character of a system is, is an interesting uh, uh, an interesting aspect uh, of this problem. Uh, I, I want to make another argument, which is quite general. Uh, if, if I want to, to do uh, adiabaticity conditions from the point of view of quantum mechanics, pure quantum mechanics, I have to solve some nasty, uh, nasty Schrodinger's equation for the amplitude of the <coughs> Of, of the ground state or the system in the, in the instantaneous ground state. It takes this form and the energies on the right hand side and the states on the right hand sides are uh, all the states in the Hilbert space of my system, which, which, which are exponentially large uh, if, I, if I have a big many body system. So it's, it's, it's an enormous uh, number of terms on the right hand side. Now this equation, if, if I write it in this form, makes no assumption about the Hamiltonian, uh, no assumption about the eigenvalue problem, doesn't know anything apart from the linear structure of, of Schrodinger's equation. So it is essentially an equation from, from uh, linear algebra. However, many body systems that we know of have extra structure Im embedded in them. Uh, they, they have sense of space, they, they have sense of locality, dimensionality, relations and stuff like that. They, they are a lot more structure rich than, than this equation case. So we need to, we thought we need to exploit this structure to, uh, to uh, move forward to, to find some um, better understanding of Adria Batista. And we hit upon the most important property of a many body system, which is the most relevant property of the many body system, which is generalized orthogonality catastrophe. It turns out that if a physical system exhibits generalized orthogonality catastrophe, then we can uh, find a 
new bounds on adiabaticity and the new adiabaticity condition, which happens to be a uh, necessary adiabaticity condition. So let's, let's imagine that we have a many-body system and we are looking at um, the overlap between the uh, ground states at lambda equals zero and a small lambda. So this uh, corresponds to finding an overlap of, of the ground state of uh, a Hamiltonian and a slightly deformed Hamiltonian. Then, as, as, as many of you know, <coughs> there, are, there is a broad range of examples where the logarithm of this quantity behaves as minus cn lambda squared plus a correction term, and this cn, this coefficient, which, I, which I'll call susceptibility, the susceptibility increases with growing n, which means that this overlap function decays as a function of the system size. So the system size in this context is an important asymptotic parameter. Uh, uh, this uh, phenomenon was first discussed by Anderson, I think, uh, and, uh, in the context of, of uh, a spin impurity embedded in the metal, and in that case, uh, lambda is just, just the coupling constant between, between the impurity and the metal. And the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Of, uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 there are different formulations of the same. Another formulation is that I just take a, a metal and I uh, uh, insert a, a non-magnetic impurity, just a simple impurity inside, and I calculate the overlap between the ground state of, of, of without an impurity and with an impurity, and that will give me the same result. I'll have Cn, which is equal to log n. So local impurity inserted in the metal gives uh, rise to orthogonality catastrophe with, with susceptibility logarithmically increasing in the system size. There is another requirement, so an additional requirement on, the, uh, on this uh, parameter here, which is um, technically fulfilled <laughs> in, in all systems that I know of. If you find a system where it is not, that would be interesting. Yes. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm discussing this in complete generality, and I'm making this the defining property of the class of the systems that I'm going to look at. This, this works, yeah, this works for gapped systems, as I'll show you in, in the subsequent examples. It depends on the, the type of driving, so this, the sort of deformation of the Hamiltonian. So we can deform the Hamiltonian of a gapped system in a natural way that gives rise to the orthogonality catastrophe. I'll show an example later on. So this is a defining property. Again, I, I'm not going to prove that this is a general case. This is, this, there are exceptions from this. Uh, and this is, this is not a theorem. This is a defining property of the system uh, that I'm, I'm going to look at. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Six minutes. Sure. OK. So um, our, our main results, we have established new rigorous bounds on the fidelity of adiabatic process in general quantum theory for systems exhibiting orthogonality catastrophe. And our estimates are given in terms of the parametric susceptibility CN only. And these results uh, give uh, useful necessary condition for adiabaticity of quantum protocols. Now, I'll give you the main idea. So the main idea is we exploit the um, metric structure of the projective Hilbert space. A projective Hilbert space is a set of vectors from the point of view of, of a, a, a linear algebra, but it is also, it can be thought of as a metric space where the metric, the distance between two points is, is defined uh, this way, for example. There, there are more than one metric, actually. Uh, so it is one minus the overlap between the two states squared, square root. <coughs> uh, another important ingredient is the quantum speed limit. Uh, again, you can, can look at the Pfeiffer's review about quantum speed limits. The idea is if you have an initial state, phi naught, and you, st you, you begin to deform the Hamiltonian of the system, then uh, the physical state cannot travel arbitrarily, arbitrarily far away from the initial point. The distance it can travel in time is limited by the quantum spin limit written here, where delta h is 
the fluctuate, well, the, the average, the time average of the uncertainty of the Hamiltonian in the initial ground state. So the Hamiltonian, uh, Hamiltonian uncertainty is, is zero. The state, of course, cannot travel from the initial point. Otherwise, it travels. Now, for, for generic driving, which is smooth, this uh, delta H here is just proportional to lambda multiplied by some number V. Okay, uh, and now here, here comes the, the, main, uh, the main trick that we use. So this is the projective Hilbert space, and this is the initial point. Now, if I deform the Hamiltonian, the orthogonality catastrophe tells me that the state phi lambda rather quickly, if the system is large, rather quickly is going to travel very, very far away from the initial point, whilst the actual physical state can't do this because of the quantum speed limit. Uh, moreover, I can give a rigorous estimate using the triangle inequality. So if I consider this triangle here, A, is, is, uh, a plus B is greater than C, and this gives me A is greater than C minus B. This directly uh, translates into the statement that the fidelity, the adiabatic fidelity of my system minus <coughs> the exponential of the, uh, minus the overlap between, between these two states is less than lambda squared to the over gamma. So this, um, for small lambda, for sufficiently small lambda, these two uh, quantities are very close. Now, this quantity is very easy to calculate. This is simple because this is just an overlap of two ground states. This quantity is very, very hard to calculate. It requires to, uh, the knowledge of, of the complete evolution uh, of, of the Hamiltonian in the Hilbert space. But with, for sufficiently small lambda, they are close to each other, and one can exploit this. So um, let's, let's see how this works. So this, this is a particular system. And this, this is the fidelity phi of lambda. This is the overlap squared of two functions. Uh, and this is, these are the bounds. This is a system where I only have 10 particles. As you can see, the bounds are not very useful here. They, they do not tell me that these two quantities are close enough. However, if I go to n equal to 100, uh, the bounds uh, become quite strong. The two susceptibilities must be close to each other within this range. And as you can see, before the bounds become useful, useless. So the, the bounds become useless somewhere in this region because the bounds increases as number squared. However, before it becomes useless, the fidelity drops by a factor of E. Now, if I increase the system size further, uh, I'll get better and better bounds on, uh, on, C, on, on F of lambda, which, which makes it close to C of lambda. So that's, that's the idea. And this is written in algebraic terms. F of lambda is e to the power minus lambda squared Cn. This we know from orthogonality catastrophe plus a correction due to the bound. If n is large, the system completely loses adiabaticity after, after having traveled this distance. Lambda star is equal to 1 over square root Cn, provided that I can neglect this term. And I can neglect this term as if v over gamma Cn tends to zero when n goes to zero. And that gives me the necessary condition for adiabaticity in the system, which is written here. Gamma has to be less than v over, over cn. OK, I'll just show two slides, two, or three slides, actually, to, to illustrate how this works in the experimental uh, system called the Talis pump. So this, the Talis pump that I, I mentioned earlier was realized in, in t these two recent experiments. Um, so this is the one-dimensional optical lattice. And there are many particles sitting there, and the cycle is performed in the parameters of the lattice here. And this is the rice mealy model, which describes this. And it has two parameters, staggering potential and uh, staggering uh, hopping. And the cycle is performed in the space of these two parameters. Now, we calculated from, from our relationships, we calculated that the diabetistic conditions and what we can see that despite the system being gapped, despite the system being gapped, the necessary condition for diabetistic is gamma less than V over Cn, scales is one over square root n because 
cn scales as n and v scales as square root n. So the adiabaticity in this system collapses with increasing system size if the driving rate is fixed. And okay, um, I'll, I'll skip this one. I'll just show you what happens uh, to the pumped charge if this, if this happens. So this is the uh, adiabaticity per cycle, uh, the fidelity per cycle. The fidelity per cycle is good here. The pumped charge uh, is one. This is the pumped charge. Now when fidelity drops, the pumped charge goes berserk. It's, it, it, uh, the quantization is completely lost. Again, in, in complete agreement with our criterion. Okay, so this is, these are the conclusions of my talk, and thank you for listening. Thank you. <clears throat>